Well, good afternoon, ladies and gents. I think I'm going to officially start our our hour together in the interest of time. We've got quite a bit of, to cover. So can I first of all just remind guests, I see Harry, Helen, Jock, Carolee, let's say, please make sure that you all are mute, um, you know, just so that we don't have to, we don't have the background noise or any potentially you know, unwarranted comments <laughs> coming at myself or any other one. So please just make sure again that you, that your mics are muted. So on behalf of myself, uh, Flirt Rock and Frick Stellenbosch Graduate Institute and, and Renell, we really want to once again, as always, welcome you. And it's a great pleasure to host all of you. And I do believe that um, you are once again in for a very, very interesting uh, discussion. Please, like you've been come, some of most of you have, that have joined us before are used to feel free to pop your, your comments and your questions in the in the chat box. Frick is going to keep his eye on the comments coming in and uh, he will summarize and pose some of those questions to Peter um, later on in, in the session as well, time permitting. So please feel free. Give us, it's always good to see your thoughts and comments coming through as well. I think um, maybe I was sort of thinking when um, I discussed with Peter this, this topic that it's probably a little bit selfish of me because. I have a particular interest um, in this topic of today. It's really of interest to me because I, I move around in so many boardrooms. And um, especially lately, you know, we, we're really going from board meeting to board meeting. And between myself and I think many of my colleagues and many of you maybe who can share, you know, stories, seeing the unfortunate consequences of the absence of, of what I sometimes just loosely refer to as EQ in uh, one or more of the, the directors in the room. You know, I've over the years become quite convinced, well, I've become quite cynical, number one, about behavior of directors, to be quite honest, but I've also become quite convinced that um, the softer, so-called softer skills or human skills, whatever you want to call it, are absolutely critical in our boardrooms. And I think considering what is lying ahead for us in uh, the next few years to uh, succeed, you know, while we're trying to steer our, our businesses and our ships through very, very rough waters, um, I think it's going to become even more critical. Uh, an effective board, in my opinion, I don't think can afford now, I don't want to sound over dramatic, but I don't think they can afford to have even one member in the boardroom who does not possess these kind of attributes or have the at least have the potential to develop the necessary the necessary attributes. And um, so I think you know, in my sorry to say, but gone are the days of the call it if you want to call it some call it charismatic. I sometimes call it arrogant leaders that we have in our boardrooms. Um, and I think we need to drastically. And yet, considering all of that and the importance of it, it, it amazes me to see how, how seldom boards, when they're either recruiting directors, actually look at that. It's looking at, at skills and qualifications and, and diversity, which are all important and I fully appreciate and understand. But very, very little is done to ascertain, you know, these traits of, of the, the person. And once they are in the boardroom, they are in the boardroom. And it's not that easy to then, if you realize that the chemistry is probably not what it should be, to then actually terminate. Especially if you have an individual that does not possess the, the kind of skills that you need to have a, a good conversation with. So the question really is, and this is what I had in the back of my mind when I started speaking to Peter to come and talk to us about this topic is, so what does it look like? What is it that I'm trying to, to put in words that I'm looking for? What is ego and what is EQ and, and why is it necessary? So with us today, we're like very privileged to have my good friend, Peter von Vieren, who I think on a daily basis is confronted in, in where he operates and he interrogates these kinds of questions that I've just posed, you know, on a very regular basis. 
is also, I think, also doing that as part of his currently completing his uh, doctorate. Peter is a clinical psychologist. He holds two master degrees. Peter, I don't know why somebody would do that to themselves, to be quite honest. <laughs> but anyway, let's move on. Um, two master's degrees in, in, uh, in MA, in, and he's got a string of other degrees as well. He's the, the founding director of Solstice Human Capital. Um, Peter teaches, so he's quite quite um, comfortable in a sort of lettering role because he teaches as a, at a number of universities and business schools. Focus really on strategy implementation and strategic human resources management and leadership and organizational change and, and performance and coaching, people management, you, you name it. And I think Peter has done it I think for more than 25 years, Peter, if I'm not uh, wrong. And, and Having had exposure to organizations, I think you also did an MBA, so you also have that business experience, but you've been involved in organizations, public sector, health, mining, financial services. So I think you bring a very broad, practical kind of um, background to this conversation. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Thank you very much, Anna-Marie. Um, Maybe I can answer your question. When you study so, so many degrees, is to prove to your teachers at school that you weren't stupid, um, that there is something more. <laughs> um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I, I, as, as Anna Maria said, as I, I do quite a lot of work in terms of leadership, leadership development, and I work currently for a company called Salsa Human Capital. And we do quite a lot of work in terms of helping organizations execute their strategies. And one of the bigger things for us is the issue of the competence of leaders, whether you are at executive level, at board level. And the competence is actually the issue that we, that we realize is not always sufficient. And so our work is then to identify what that competence is and to develop it. Um, and that brings us to the conversation of, well, what would be then the competence in terms of the boardroom? Um, and when we talk then about boardroom leadership, and if I can just find my my controls here, it would be so much easier. Peter, while you're finding your controls, can I just mention to our attendees as well, you can you will be able to see Peter's presentation, but in the right-hand corner, there's a little expand button. So if you are having difficulty to see the detail on his slide, you're also welcome to expand his presentation. That should expand it for you on, on your screen. Again, can I just make sure, please ask our guests, everybody make sure that your mics are on mute. Thanks, Peter. Thank you very much, Anna-Marie. So, um, so Anna-Marie asked me to talk about this idea of ego versus EQ, and, um, and it made me think um, whether it is either or. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about today and have a conversation with you that I think that it, it requires a bit more than just EQ or ego. Um, when we look at specific leadership roles, the question is always for us in terms of, well, what is required? Um, and specifically when it comes to board leadership, the, the question for us is, is, as you see, is, well, what competency do a board member require? Now, competency consists of a number of things, knowledge, a mindset, but mostly in terms of skill. And when you see here where my cursor is, the skill is often about communication, leadership, and influencing. And so when we looked at leadership development, that's the area where we actually focus on. And the idea around that is, is that if we have these competencies, then what we could do is, is we, we can actually be effective leaders at whichever level. Now, at a board, le a board level, um, each, it's not just the chair that's the leader, but every director at the board is a leader. And the intention of leadership is then to deliver a specific outcome. Many people actually think about leadership as a trait but it's actually a process. And the process of leadership is actually a multiple number of activities where we try to take the context, the context of the board, and what we try, we have specific outcomes that we want to achieve. And what we are doing is, is we're using our leader to influence our followers to actually achieve that, those specific outcomes. Now, the dilemma, unfortunately, is, is that in previous uh, sort of iterations, leadership has always been an issue in terms of traits, in terms of the personality. And I think that there is a fundamental dilemma with that, that leadership is more than that. Um, and so I believe that there's some basic truths about leadership. The one is, is that a leader is, uh, is somebody that has to achieve results to other members. If you think about your board leadership, 
as the chair has to achieve the board objectives through the members of the board. And so does each um, board member. Um, to, to represent the shareholders as you do, you actually have to manage and engage with this, the board members to achieve the objectives. But leadership at the core of it is actually about intentional influence. There's a great deal of romance about it, you know, the strong man, the dealer in hope, but it's actually about influence. And what we are doing as leaders is we are intentionally influencing people. And if you don't do that, there's a problem. Uh, a guy that I didn't like so much, John Maxwell, wrote the book 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. And he said, a leader without any followers is only taking a walk. Um, and I find it quite uh, ironic that there's many people that, that bear the title of leader, but actually don't have any followers. And I think that you might have seen that in boards as well, is that you might have multiple people occupying the positions, but not really achieving the objectives or actually influencing people around them. So the question then is, is why? Um, why is this? And I think that the issue is about the ego, that people actually use their personality or their tool, the ego, to influence other people to deal with it. Now, Albert Einstein went and he said, well, actually, ego is a problem. Um, he says, more the knowledge, less of the ego. Less of the knowledge, more the ego. And he says that actually our ego that features is actually a sign of ignorance and a bit of arrogance. Um, but I think he's a bit crude. I think he's a bit harsh in terms of that. I think we need to look a little bit more about this thing called ego and whether that is a tool of influence or not. Um, now, what's the ego? Now, the ego uh, is the Latin for I, the self. And it comes a little bit from Freud, uh, Sigmund Freud that talked about this idea that said, well, the ego is this entity that sits between our it and our super ego and manages these two challenges. So what's the it? Well, the it are our basic impulses. It's the things we want, we want it, um, and it's that two-year-old sort of personality of yours. So you want to eat now, you want to drink now, you want to play now, you want to do exactly what you want now. The superego is sort of the, the morality of society, of what's right and what's wrong. And this ego thing that sits in the middle is actually the entity that actually manages these two, the it and the superego. And it then talks about this idea of personality that we actually have to have an ego. And the point is, is well, what is the ego strength then specifically? Now, Freud said, well, actually, it depends on this ego strength of to what extent we uh, can maintain our own identity or our sense of self. So what does that mean? It's actually, well, I'm actually the ego is the, is the entity where I define who I am and where I can stand my ground and how I can have a sense of self, a self-definition in terms of that. So in essence, is ego, is not, ego is not necessarily wrong. The question around ego is, unfortunately, is as well, actually, uh, uh, is the amount of exaggeration. Now, when we look at normality and in psychology, we always ask this question, what is normal, what is functional? And I use a normal bell curve just to talk a little, a little bit about it. That. The idea around actually anything, let's just take sleep for, ex for example. If we sleep one hour a, a day, we have a big problem. That's the extreme, the outlier problem. On the other side, if I sleep 24 hours a day, same problem. The normality lies here somewhere in the middle. It's about the seven, eight, nine hours. The, if, I, if there's one day that I actually have uh, sleeping 12 hours, not a problem. If there's one day that I'm sleeping uh, four hours, not a problem. The problem, unfortunately, is these exaggerated ego. What we talk about is the big ego and the weak, weak ego. Um, and what we are aspiring to is the strong ego, this ego strength that we are talking about. Now, um, what we are then saying is, is that, and let me just see why the slide is not coming up. And I think I'll just let's skip the slide there. Okay, the slide is not showing. Um, but what... The idea around that is, is basically is if we then think about our ego, it talks about two things. We normally see these different types of personalities. Now, what's the ego? The ego is the inner persona. It's the things that sort of subconscious. Um, and the personality is the outer persona. So what you often see uh, at board level um, from people behaving in a certain way, the personality is the outer persona but it's fed through this inner persona. And what we often see is these different things. 
The bad ego, but what I talk about is the weak ego, is people that actually cannot resist the impulses, cannot deal with actually postponing specific uh, um, impulses that is coming their way. They have a fragile sense of identity, they're unstable emotionally, they're vulnerable. Um, and what's interesting about it is that they often have a sense of self that is grandiose, su uh, almost a superiority complex. The same work on the other side, about big ego. Um, it's about the high opinion of self, thinks they are the best, the most worthy, opinions are most important. And what I've done is I've put a, a guide here, um, which is actually a great example of a person with a big ego, um, President Donald Trump. And we'll talk a little bit about him. What I am proposing is that ego is actually a good thing for us, but it depends on the idea that we need to have a strong ego. Uh, idea where I can actually differentiate myself from other people, where I have self-knowledge, where I can actually make a plan and pull through, where I can choose decisively, um, where I'm not overwhelmed by things that's coming my way. And so in a way, this strong ego is what we aspire to. In my, in my view, ego is essential. The question just is, is that if we are seeing behavior of bad or a weak ego and behavior of big ego, question is, is, well, how do we actually respond to that? Now, you will see. And I think Donald Trump is a great example for us of a person that's been put in a position and actually are using uh, his personality to actually achieve results. Uh, one of his biggest problems is not necessarily getting people to, to support him. His problem is actually is to actually pull through specific objectives. He's spending most of his time actually fighting the the internal battles, the politics in their own house. Uh, in the White House, the problem is, is the leaks that's going on. What we find is, is that if we see leaders with the, 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 as we call it, the big ego or the weak ego, it has an impact on the rest of us. And we see that behavior all over, behavior that's quite destructive for us. Now, the question is, is how do we actually achieve this? How do we actually deal with the bad ego and the big ego to actually get to a, to a strong ego. And this is where I want to actually suggest that we need to actually start thinking about this idea of um, dealing with our, uh, the physiology of our brain. And I have to explain this a little bit in this way. So yeah, I've given you a, a very crude way of telling you of how the brain works. Now, well, the one thing about it is, is, is this idea. Now, let's just quickly talk about the parts of it and then we'll talk about how they interact. Our personality, is formed here by the age of seven, and it doesn't necessarily change. It sits at this level in it, and what you've heard often is when people talk about a frontal lobotomy, when people get damaged, their, their personality actually changes. What we do is we think at this level, our new cortex, and what we also find is here in our limbic system, we actually feel the feelings that we have. The amygdala sits right here, and it's actually that area of our brain that actually triggers our flight and flight response, or fight and flight response. Now, what often happens with us is we talk about this idea that a person with a big ego or a weak ego has not necessarily developed the, the, the different pathways in the brain to be able to do this. So what you will find is, is that um, personality, which is there from the age of seven, and Donald Trump's niece is writing a beautiful story about his narcissism that is developed from the youngest age, and she says this behavior has not just happened today. So his neural pathways has been formed to actually behave in a certain way. So his personality, the way of thinking about it, is actually giving instructions down the line. However, what we are saying is, is that, well, the reason why he's doing that is his existing pathways are there, but also every time you see him panic, struggle, put under pressure, that he actually gets overwhelmed by emotion and he makes rash decisions, behave in a certain way. Now, we call that the amygdala hijack. So when we get flooded by our emotions, we have old patterns that we fall back onto and it actually forces us back into very archaic behavior as the behavior we will see specifically in a, uh, in a big ego or in a weak ego. Now, to deal with this, we actually have to start developing new neural pathways. And the neural pathways is actually is, is how do we actually undo or the basic processes of actually getting hijacked by our medulla, or how do we actually find better ways in terms of our personality? And we'll talk a little bit about EQ later on, but the idea around EQ is, is that actually it is understanding our feelings 
and then allowing our thinking processes to actually make sense of that, make decisions for better behavior in the future. And my view is, is that, that a lot of the options, a lot of the behavior that we see in terms of boardroom behavior, in terms of good ego, bad ego, what we find is, is that it is a function of how the brain has been developed. Now you ask me, now how does this work? Well, actually the idea around this is, and I see that almost every second of my slides is actually um, not working. So let's just do this. So this is where one gets tested on how well, you're, how well you've prepared. So I'll take the conversation to the next level. Anna Marie. It's probably because you've got it's your trade secrets that's on those slides, Peter, that you've got. <laughs> oh. But you can take you can talk us through what it is that you know that's on that slide that we don't that we fantastic. don't. Fantastic. Now I can actually improvise as I go along. So what I will do is this, I'm gonna uh, talk through it. I just want to see where my next slide is. Oh here it comes. So it's just taking a while to actually to, to upload. Um, so one of the interesting things about this is that I want to propose to you that actually how do we how do we deal with this? How do we actually deal with this behavior with people in the boardroom or individuals that actually suffers from a, a, a big ego or a weak ego? Well, one of them is basically is to create new pathways and um, to build a strong ego, to actually undo the, 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 the patterns and the neuropathic paths of the past. The second one is just to actually develop effective leader skills and basically eventually talk, deal with that. And the way we do that is, is we take the personality plus your IQ and we complement this with emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence on the one that gives you the skills, but it also gives you the process of building these new, new neural pathways. Now, what's interesting about that is, is, well, what's this emotional intelligence? Well, it's the ability to understand one's own emotions, to empathize with other people, to understand them, to actually manage yourself, but also to have the social skill to other influence other people. Now, Goldman was the, was the sort of the brain guy. He made it very popular. He said one of the interesting things about emotional intelligence, and I'll give you an example, famous experiment. He actually sat at Harvard and he gave, put a lot of um, children um, in the classroom and he put a cupcake in, each, in front of each of them. And he said to them, okay, each one of you are allowed to eat that cupcake, but if you resist and the teacher leaves the room and come back and your cupcake is still there, you will get a second cupcake. And so what they then did was they and they looked at the, uh, the they executed the experiments. When they got back, half the class were cupcakes were gone. Other half of the class cupcakes cupcakes were still there. And then what they did, they tracked the performance of those children into adulthood. And there was a significant statistical correlation between the success of those children that resisted the cupcake and those who ate it immediately. Now, how does this work? Goldman says, well, the interesting thing around this is, is, it's not, is, is the process of EQ is the understanding of the self. Is, am I, do I know why I'm doing that? Why am I behaving this way? So the self-understanding is a critical component of that. If I know that I am... Uh, specifically tempted by the cupcake, the second part of EQ is how do I influence myself? How do I manage myself? How do I regulate myself? The ability to do this actually gives me insight into understanding other people. If I understand other people, I can also then develop the skill of actually influencing them, managing the relationship, doing things better. Now, if we take this plus the ego, what we are then saying is, is we find that people that use ego or personality to drive influence behave in a certain way. It's often a, a function of being self-aware or not being able to regulate themselves and also therefore not aware of what the impact on other people and therefore not having developed the skill of influence going forward. Now, Goldman then says actually, is the way of developing this is a very process. So I'm just going to give the slide a moment to come up um, as a process of developing EQ, saying, well, actually, the way of developing EQ is then first to start with self-awareness, then to move to self-management. And only when we've completed these tasks will we be able to actually become socially aware and therefore start managing our relationships. And what we find then specifically with the, the development of EQ, uh, EQ it is not necessarily a program that you go on to, but it's actually a process of developing myself, of finding insight in terms of that. And so what we are proposing then specifically 
is this idea that actually EQ and ego is quite critical. And so the idea around dealing with our boardroom uh, uh, dilemmas is this idea of first to look at ourselves as individuals and to say, well, how do we as individuals then actually manage this? What is, it, what is my personal EQ development steps? Now, the first one is basically is get help. So I'm not going to beat around the bush. It's get help. Uh, find a coach, a mentor, a community of practice. The second part of that is get the feedback. Um, so how am I showing up in the boardroom and what is the impact that I have on other people? The third one is face the brutal facts is, well, now that you know that you're not performing the way you should, let us actually find out where's your gaps, where's the development areas. And so the idea around that is, is basically is then to, if I know those development areas, let me commit to action. Let me actually start managing that specifically through a personal development process. And the first step is basically start experimenting. This is not this is not a course that you attend. This is actually a development of new neuro pathways to deal with it. And I can guarantee you, the warranty of this process is that your spouse will notice and that you will be a much more much more happier in your relationship than going before. I also think that there's opportunity for us to actually deal with this specifically in in the boardroom is what could be our specific strategies in terms of that. And I believe that there's a few things we can do. Strategies in the boardroom is quite a simple process of saying, well, we have to actually create in our boardroom and within our, uh, within our board a specific awareness um, of how are we operating and what is it that we need to, what, what is it we need to do. So self-awareness can be created by 360-degree feedback, we can look at personality profiling, EQ profiling. It gives people insight on how they're operating. Self-regulation could be about how do we actually establish a code of contact, conduct? How do we behave? What's the rules? And then the second part of that is the idea of the state us actually agree on what is our development process as a board member or as a board as a whole. And then get the coaching, get the mentoring, get people to assist you in dealing with that. Understanding empathy is, is dealing with well, who's sitting around this board and what is their departure point? Where do they come from? The only way we can actually find out where people come from and to manage and influence them effectively is to find out where do they, what is important to them? How do they deal with, what is, what is, it, what is the triggers for them? And we only find those things by understanding people's life stories, what motivates them. And some of the tools we can use is Enneagram, et cetera. Motivation is one of those parts where we talk about objective setting, and board evaluation. So one of them is basically to say, well, to motivate people to actually adopt this behavior is, well, let's do board evaluation in terms of how we conduct ourselves and the dynamics of the board and then set some objectives to become a high-performing board. And one of those ways is actually to get to that. And the last one is then basically the social skills, the skills training, the art of influence, debate, conflict, rules of engagement. I can guarantee you that when you bring these strategies uh, to fruition, that what will happen is that people will physically create new neural pathways that will actually just start changing their behavior. It builds stronger uh, ego, but it also gives the influence in terms of that. I want to actually stop here, and I've got a few slides still that talks about strategies we can actually employ within the boardroom. But I think at this stage of the conversation, I think that I've given you enough information to start a conversation. Um, and so I'm going to stop there and open the floor then for questions or comments um, to, uh, pertaining to that. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I'm going to, I've got a few questions, but I'm going to ask Renel to just maybe, Renel, you shoot first and then I will follow up on that. Um, thanks so much. I mean, this is very, very interesting stuff. I mean, one of the things that we often struggle with is when you get to a board, there's already board members. Some of them are very high profile people. Um, they've reached a lot in their life. Um, they're not necessarily uh, grew wet behind the ears anymore. You know, there's some gray hair. And, and, and it's sometimes hard to be in a boardroom where people would be on your Donald Trump side of the of your curve, of your bell curve. How would you how would you deal with that? How would you advise a, a director or a company secretary, whoever is dealing with the board, to, to deal with um, that kind of personality? 
Well, there's two parts to it. I do believe that actually as part of as the board uh, competence is the ability to actually engage effectively as a board. And so part of the competence of board members should be in the specific criteria of emotional intelligence or the way that we do things around here. And so for me, the first part of that is, is that we have pre-existing board members around it. The one is, is if we can't change the structure, we can actually then coerce the board to actually start agreeing to what would be the rules of engagement, of how we're going to engage with one another. If that doesn't work, the second part of that is actually is, is using emotional intelligence to influence people in a different way. Now, the slides that I will that, that will follow, which I'm not going to take bit by bit, but one of them is actually is to spend time with understanding a person that actually behaves in a certain way. Let me give you an example. If we find a person that is using personality and force to actually influence position and that actually is always right, never wrong, um, only listen to their own opinion, it gives you great insight from, if you have got EQ that there's something about that person that is lacking. Um, there's something that they are dealing with um, and they're using this pattern to actually achieve a certain result. Now, what could it be? Well, Mostly, when we see these overinflated behaviors, these exaggerated behaviors, it points to the opposite, to the inferiority, to the lack of skill. And so for us to, to attack that person with confrontation is not achieving anything. The question is, is we have to look at what lies below that, what lies in terms of the ego. What is missing there? Let me deal with that. Um, one of them is uh, basically to, is to respond with it, speaking specifically to the issues in, in ego of, well, you seem to be quite aggrieved by this process, and I can see that you're quite adamant to it. And that behavior, just calling the, the, the feelings, actually gives the person the impression that you know what, is, what, what they're going through, and they do not have to use this exaggerated behavior to actually achieve the point. And so one of them is, is a rule of thumb for me is, is to go look at what's the opposite of that behavior. And often the opposite is actually the lack of ego, the lack of confidence, the lack of power that I have in that situation. Brunel, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, it's as if, as you go through your presentation, it just shows, it also points back, you know, you need to work on your own EQ. Because we're, we're, we're entering this conversation assuming we have a great EQ, but the better your own EQ is, the better you can manage those others. And I, and I see a comment from Ayanda to say that, you know, she's met very big people that know their stories and their worth, you know, they, and I'm also thinking that you're saying that they are very humble, and that's also very true. So just point back at yourself as well. Thanks, anna -Marie. Yeah, I think that's an important point because, you know, Peter, I was also thinking, your, your problem with the big ego people, of course, is for me to go and tell them that I think they need some coaching. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a bit career limiting, you know, uh, for you and, and even could potentially be life threatening. Um, so you want, it's something that needs to be dealt with in a very subtle manner. But, you know, um, so for me as well, I have found where we've dealt with boards and even doing board evaluations, as soon as you start suggesting that there's this kind of process of also evaluating the softer skills that the fear comes in. You know, people don't, they, they're worried that they're going to be showed up as being, you know, not having the kind of skills that they should have. So I think it is a tricky thing to, and I, and I think the chair, maybe that's a starting point for one's board, is to actually, as a part of the chair's uh, development, to take them through a bit of this understanding, you know, a, a, so not don't just talk to them about quorum and, and, you know, the agenda and things like that, but also help them understand a little bit more human behavior and how best to get the best out of people. And, 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 and I've, I've seen, to your point, that I have often realized how what seems to be a big ego is actually just hiding a very, very small ego, you know, um, and that's the way in which it's done. But the other point that, you know, I, from my side, that I think that you said, it's very critical for us on the call to take. I'm now talking about helping the chair to lead, but each board member is a leader. And so we each, to Renelle's point, we each have a responsibility to first, before you start looking at other people's behavior, to look at your own behavior and get a better understanding 
of yourself and also the insight about people's behavior and how to to respond, you know, so that I think that understanding that as a board member, I am in my own right a leader. Um, and therefore, I need to take responsibility for how I influence your intentional influencing. What am I going to do to intentionally influence in a, in a positive manner? But Sharon asked the question, and maybe I can just also, because can you improve on your EQ? Is there a way in which, in a subtle way, we as a board, we can recommend to our boards as well some kind of program that's not going to make them feel threatened? but that will give them the necessary insight to actually start understanding the importance of the things that we're talking about today. Great. So maybe I could just respond to your first question. So I, I do, don't think it's very productive to go up to a person and say, well, you know, you need coaching, your EQ sucks, um, so you need help. Um, but I think that, that part of our, you know, with, with, with a great amount of EQ, what we do have is the, is the opportunity to interview and using some coaching skills. One of them is to ask the question is, is you know, our objective here is to have an effective board um, and your contribution today, how, see, how do you think that actually added to the success of this board? Um, and, you know, do you think there's another way of actually doing that? Um, do you think um, that you could reach people, influence people in a different way? Those three questions, are uh, really basic coaching coaching technique to help people actually start to reflect on well, okay, what I've done didn't really land the way I wanted it. Do I have other options? How can I do this in a different way? And it actually start building EQ immediately by just asking the right question. It's a process of intentional influence. So I think that we as as uh, professionals have to uh, need this as a critical skill, EQ at, at, at the core but also then the ability, the skills of actually creating awareness and influencing people. The last part is that social skill and sound of that. To your second question, yes, I think EQ is the, the, the quick route to emotional intelligence and the development of emotional intelligence is to actually do an assessment. Um, but the assessment tied to performance in the workplace. So just doing an EQ assessment is not sufficient, but actually saying, well, let us look at how productive we are in the working environment, in the board environment, and let's then link our EQ assessment to it. It creates the self-awareness immediately. Where's the gaps? Immediately. And it points to the areas of, of development. Um, and then to actually go through a process. Coaching is a great opportunity to do it, but you can go through some interesting um, guided journeys to help you actually develop and understand where do I come from, where do I go to, how do I do this better. So, yes, you can actually fast-track the development of emotional intelligence very quickly um, in a very limited way. But it applies, implies also that you have to actually do the work. You have to, it's not a course you attend, it's a new way of living. Fundamentally, at the core of it, I'm repeating myself, is, the, is building the new pathways in your brain so that you physically are changing the physiology of your brain structure. And that you do by repetition. And so this is how we build emotional intelligence. Peter, if I can, sorry for interjecting here. I just want to come back to a question that Trevor has asked uh, 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 higher up in the ribbon. And that is how does EQ apply or help or assist in the domain of power? Because where, where a board operates, that's where the, the complexity demands of leadership is most probably the highest. And you find very powerful context and powerful people in a key role player or a major shareholder, etc. People exerting power in that space. What, how does EQ assist in that space? Yeah. So, for a uh, good question. So, the, the emotional intelligence is not just the neural power phase in your brain. It's actually about learning the social skill of engaging with people and how do I influence them. Now, within a board level, there are significant people with significant um, you know, power bases. Um, how do I leverage that? Well, one of the things of EQ is, is actually is the ability to understand, well, what is the source of that power? Now, I'm not talking about the number of shareholders or the number of shares that you represent. I'm talking about, well, obviously this person is using uh, inflated ego to achieve a certain result. 
So they're using force of personality. Um, they're using coercive tactics to get you to a point where you actually will do what they want you to do. If you understand what they're trying to achieve, you can actually anticipate that and respond to that without them actually using that, that behavior, which actually, which actually cancels that requirement for the behavior. So the, the, the advantage of emotional intelligence is actually the ability to read people, not just what you see at face value, but also what lies below that, what's driving this behavior. And I would, from a psychology perspective, is that all behavior drives a certain reward. We do things because we get rewarded for it. If I use my power, I get the reward for using that power. If I, if I get the reward without having to use the power, my behavior will change. And so EQ gives you that opportunity to read the person and to intervene in an appropriate way without them actually having to use that ex exaggerated behavior to get to their results. But the first part of that is, is that the only way you learn about that is by understanding yourself and being able to manage yourself because that's the key into understanding how other people operate, etc. I know I'm extending the question, but it means that we actually have to, as human beings, have to understand our personality work, how motives work, how drives work. We need to become more psychologically minded. We have to understand how people operate and how that leads to performance. That's a sort of a higher grade emotional intelligence because that gives us a, a toolkit that we can actually use influencing people without using the behavior that, that normally was, uh, was employed. I think that's very significant because how I, uh, how I behave and conduct myself in those power environments is also a function of where I find myself in terms of my own uh, uh, emotional intelligence development or whether I am in a good uh, in a in in the strong ego week or in the in the bad ego because wherever I come from makes a contribution to the to the next level where this conversation is going to. That's beautiful. I mean, the issue is it's a dance. Uh, it's a dance. So if you if a person with a, with a, with an inflated ego. Um, are doing their dance, you have to decide. And often our option is to take the weak ego, to almost be submissive, to give in. Um, and what it, what it allows us to do is, is, is that if a person is dancing in front of you, if you step back and see the game, you see the dance, you can intervene in the appropriate way and also understand what your role is in that. Yeah, and, I, and especially when you refer to empathy, I mean, empathy just allows you to read the room. Correct. Correct. It is that it's that soft data, reading it, reading the mood, understanding it, um, and I think that that is again the skill of that only comes from understanding where you come from. Why do you behave this way? How do other people behave that way? And then you can step into their shoes and understand what is it that drives it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I fully, you know, I agree, but, and, and I think, Peter, to the point as well that, um, and, and um, Marishan also made the point in her comments, she says, you know, how many boards actually spend time on reflecting on the impact, you know, of their behavior and, and how they can improve? Again, I think a lot on the shoulder of the chair to initiate that kind of conversation to create a, a safe environment where we can be honest, have open, honest, you know, communication um, with ourselves. And, of course, sometimes, unfortunately, um, you know, the chair could be the, the problem. <laughs> so that's where, you know, and, and they agree with Ayanda on her comment. That's where a, comp a good, effective, um, high-caliber company secretary needs to somehow try and, in a subtle way, help, you know, with the chair and, and the other directors as well because ultimately if we really think about it there's a reason also why we're pushing for diversity in boards it is because people bring different uh, perspectives different experiences to the table and the idea is that we want to put all of that in the pot and then bring the best out of that in the interest of the organization so you have to expect that people are going to differ from you you know that that comes with the territory and then your ability to see the perspective of the other people, who is it, Stephen Covey, to say, seek first to understand, then to be understood. If we can have that kind of approach of our leadership, you know, I just think 
that would be so much, you know, empowering for a board to really, because let's be honest as well, I sometimes think to myself, um, my, pers my, my sort of uh, perspective that a board is sometimes, to be quite honest and being very quick here, more a source of frustration for management than a value act. I'm sorry, that's just, I know that's reality. And so how do a board needs to ask themselves, how do we make sure, to your point, every meeting we leave, that we have left something of value, that we've put something of value on the table for management and for this organization? Great, great. I, I, I think well, the, the dilemma, unfortunately, is, is that I don't think that there's a, always a collective objective. Um, and I think that that is the part of... of, of teams mostly specifically and at a board level is, is that do we have a collective objective and do we have actually have criteria that, that we have to comply with and what is then the input factors that actually will help us achieve that? Um, because you, if you look at King 4, if you look at all these competencies, it's great definitions of what's required. Um, the question is, is how effective are we and, but, and also how do we, the dynamics of the board, as well as the different members um, and their style of engaging, how that's affecting the success of the board. And I believe that that is the second part of it, is, is that I think that eventually it needs to go back to a, a business objective, a board uh, output that's required. The input factor to that is then definitely people that function at a different level, that creates a different reality. And I believe fundamentally at the core of it is the emotional intelligence. Peter, I'm referring here to a question of Ansi, where she says, as a non-executive director, it's sometimes a big challenge to disagree constructively in a board meeting. And there's almost a temptation to take a more convenient road of groupthink. Can, uh, can, can you touch on that? And maybe if I can extend it also to other concepts happening uh, of my, from my experience in a boardroom. The, the notion of risk aversion, okay? because you take all your decisions or most of your decisions have got very high risks built in into them. How, how does your how does your EQ help you in, in combination with your ego to deal with risk aversion so that uh, uh, even the concept of optimism, you have people that are that just go from one level of op optimism to another level so that they, they almost don't see anything wrong they don't see the the, the, the pitfalls, etc., or, or they become so overconfident in the, in the process that they really lose touch with reality. How do you sit in a boardroom as a non-executive director and you see these things happen, and how do you tap into your emotional intelligence to assist you to disagree constructively and, and, and almost constructively challenge those kind of behaviors or directions of thinking. Perfect. So thanks, Frank. I think that the issue is, is if we look at it, you'll see in some of in the slides that I that I, that, that will follow, um, we talk about this idea of well, how do I actually create uh, insight by to the board and members in the board? Uh, so here I'm sitting in as a non-executive board member. Um, I want to influence this conversation. Um, I feel that I can't necessarily challenge them. So what would be the best way of dealing with that? Well, one of them is actually is the opportunity to sit back and to read the situation, to understand what is it that drives them and how and what are the what's the full story here? Why are they pursuing this? The second part is, is there to ask the questions, so to ask questions that makes them think. Many people use these questions to get to an answer. So uh, what are we trying to do? We're trying to avoid risk. Um, gives you the answer. It doesn't make the other person think. And so if you use really uh, an approach of saying, well, actually, I'm going to ask a question to create awareness. I'm going to ask a question to influence people. Um, and then the idea is just to pose that question. Now, the one way of it is actually is not to participate in the conversation, but to actually speak last and then use questions to raise awareness rather than questions to get to an answer. Um, and the idea would be, is, is as I've given the, the example, is as well, um, we are making this decision. Is this decision helping us achieve our goal as a board? And if we, is, is risk 
avoidance, the only objective of a board. Um, are we not all thinking in, uh, are we not using group think here to, to, be, to get to a quick answer? And all of those prompts are ways for people to, without challenging them, without getting into a personality confrontation, it actually creates awareness, reflection, and it improves the conversation in terms of that. A nice way of doing that is to say, well, if uh, it, it does not reduce our risk, if, if risk avoidance is not our only option, what else do we have to achieve? So we need to give strategic direction to this, to this board. Are we achieving those two together? Um, and those are questions, again, that probes but creates awareness and influences. On, your, on the issue around group thinking, I was in, an, in a discussion with the CEO of a well-known listed company yesterday, and I raised this point, and I, I'm seeing this point coming through in the comments as well. And it's a concern for me over, because we were just talking about, the CEO was saying that he's finding the Zoom meetings working well for board meetings. And I then made the comment that I'm concerned over the impact of those, of Zoom meetings on the quality of discussion, you know, and our ability. How do we, because it's, we, again, we have to accept it's going to be part of where we're going. So, you know, it doesn't, so how do we try and adapt our our behavior and, and the way we function and operate? What tips do we give our chair to help him to make sure that he does not uh, compromise on the quality of the discussion in a virtual meeting room? Cool. So it's quite interesting. I just came, got out of, out of a three and a half hour exco meeting with a company where we actually are looking at how do we build a high performance team as an executive committee in a virtual environment. Um, and one of the things that we have discovered is, is that if we just use this, follow the prompts of a virtual environment, our conversation will become one directional. Um, we will be very task driven. We will conclude business very quickly. And if the room are, are full of introverts, um, the, the meeting will, will happen very quickly and end very quickly. So how do we actually build a high performance team in a virtual environment. And I believe that what we have to do, do is, is actually provide opportunity for, uh, for, for in the online environment to actually have the normal social processes continue. We talk about uh, uh, rituals within, within a specific board. A simple one, to give you an idea around it. Uh, Cecil many years used the example of saying when we check into any meeting, we use the robot, so you will have to actually decide, am I green, am I amber, or am I red? And what does it do? It actually gives us an idea of where you are at the moment. So if I'm red, things are not going well, and you have an opportunity to deal with that. Um, if you're amber, it's so-so. If you're green, everything is fine. Now, a ritual like that actually brings the humanity back into it, but it also gives us opportunity to understand what is the, where the person is coming from, what creates the mindset of this meeting, what are some of the struggles that they have at this moment, and it gives us, again, influence um, into how, what are the props that we have to, 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 to take, all the levers we have to pull to influence that behavior. It gives us insight into what lies behind the behavior that we see. And I believe that in a virtual environment, we are, are, have to change our processes and actually make the social processes that have always been almost automatic. We need to make it much more profound and we have to actually create a checklist, a protocol for bringing that back. Without that, we as, as human beings, as social beings, uh, will not survive and we will not get to the best solution. We will always get to a point where we'll attend to the task, complete that, but we lose all the additional benefits of collaborative work, um, team spirits, um, working together. Uh, the, the, the sum of the team is more than just the parts. Thanks, Peter. Ronel, any, we sort of have to close up. Any closing remarks from your side and then Fripp? Yeah, well, thank you very much. Peter, thanks so much. I really enjoyed this. It, it really does. Um, because, you know, we sit in a lot of boards where you have, for example, a difficult uh, or, or a powerful CEO, powerful chair, powerful members. And and sometimes some directors get locked, you know, in that. So I think we need to 
somehow bring them out. And it's, it's a lot of times the introverts who can give so much, and especially on Zoom, they get even lost even further. So that training of the chair, and I think just having a conversation with the chair is very important. And then my takeaway is the me need to improve. And we need to find different ways of reading the room on Zoom. So, for example, if the camera is off, the person's video is off, you know, there's a reason, right? Either, yes, maybe, you know, someone stepped into the room, but maybe they're not engaged. So that's an interesting one to look at for me as well. But thank you very much. And that's all for me. So, no, um, I just love the way in which you, how you changed from a negative to a positive when you said a uh, difficult and then a powerful CEO and chair. Well done for that. You see how, how your brain patterns are so already, you know, improved by zero. No, I'm very impressed. Frick. All right, Anna Marie, I have to summarize. Uh, and uh, I am very grateful that we had Peter here today. And I think he actually did the summary for us with that bell curve on the ego. And it seems to me, from what I'm hearing here, number one, is we have to find a way to integrate this behavioral dimension more strongly into the traditional board uh, environment. The second thing that I picked up from this conversation is, and I think some of the people ref uh, in jest referred to it in, in, in the ribbon in the questions, it's, it, it will start with me. Uh, if anything needs to happen in that environment, it has to start with me because where I am and the contribution I make in that environment will add to the quality or the constructiveness of the conversation happening. And that kind of self-awareness is becoming a major uh, important thing for anyone sitting on a board and contributing. And I think there's a lot of um, good stuff that is sitting in that slide that I would really like to unpack in more detail. But that self-awareness that, that that leads to the self-management kind of, uh, especially in stressful environments where we have to take, take decisions, where we want to avoid people manipulating information, where we overestimate synergies uh, in, 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 in our approach, in our decision-making. All of that self-management that social awareness of reading the room and then actually the major uh, end of all of this, how do I manage relationships with myself and with others and with stakeholders? And this is a great uh, window opening up for much more conversation on what needs to happen in, in the boardroom and in the development of myself and my colleagues at, at board level. Thank you for that, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Frick. I want to, just in closure, just refer, for those of you who are more interested in this topic, a couple of years, many years ago, I think I stumbled across, I don't think you can call it an article because I think it was about 100 pages long, but it, but the, the, the heading attracted my attention immediately and the heading was bias in the boardroom, psychological foundations and legal implications of corporate cohesion. Now, that is quite a mouthful, especially for, you know, as Blanc van der but I found it really informative in understanding the, the, the psychology also behind boardroom behavior. And I really want to, those of you interested, pop me a mail and I can even send you, although I do it in two parts because I think it's it's quite um, big, the, the entire document, but it also makes for some very, very interesting reading to give some insight into board and the reason why we have boards running organizations. Peter, thank you so much for sharing your insight with us. It was really insightful. I could see from the comments people have really enjoyed it. We, I wish we had the whole afternoon. I think we could have really interrogated, but we're hoping that this was of value for people. They know where to contact you should they wish to take the discussion further. Thanks, Rick Renell, for your participation. For all of you on the, on the call and engaging with us, it was great to have you. We look forward, God willing, to seeing you in two weeks' time when we're probably going to be talking to Professor William Gomedi on a few interesting topics as well. Have a great day, great afternoon. Stay warm and stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.